Good evening, everyone. We are finishing to and rounding off the uh, series from Genesis to Deuteronomy, and particularly the Exodus journey. Um, we take a quick look at the Israelites, just a very quick one, okay? And we see that repeatedly the Israelites traveling through the wilderness with Moses, they face setbacks. Yeah, they face problems of no water, no food, and sometimes getting attacked by enemies. They get disappointed because the journey is very tiring, very long, and they often feel like giving up whenever they encounter difficulties. And that's when they they get this feeling of, oh, if only, if only, if only, you know, they keep looking back to Egypt where they came from and yearning for the easy and enjoyable little treats of the unsaved life. That's the good part about being in Egypt. And then they lose faith in God and they also give in to disbelief and discouraging talk. People who talk, talk, complain, grumble, compare, right? Uh, they give in to disbelief and discouraging talk, people and situations. And this is not unusual because these are also our behaviors and our experiences as Christians. There are times we face setbacks, we get disappointed with people, with our experiences with God, yeah? And they, these Israelites, they are a picture of what God's people are like, even today. Christians who grumble, complain. And their experiences teach us much about ourselves and our relationships with God and with each other, how we behave, how we affect each other. You know, sometimes people, Christians get together, they complain about pastor, they complain about leaders, they complain about people. So we behave and we affect each other uh, in both encouraging as well as negative ways. And these Israelites on their journey are a picture and also a mirror reflection of our own same human nature with lessons to learn and also examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. And this part I'm quoting from 1 Corinthians 10 verse 6. What they went through, the lessons and examples, keep us from setting our hearts on evil things like they did. So in that sense, what they go through are lessons for us to learn to apply from their behaviors and from their lives. So it's a very good, uh, it's a very good uh, story of the Israelites traveling in the journey to reflect on ourselves. Okay, what they have gone through, uh, there is a spiritual equivalent for many of us. But at the same time, you know, uh, there are good things. And Psalm 105 is a psalm that reveals the story of Egypt, the plagues and the exodus of Israel. So it's a psalm that kind of goes through, revises, uh, what the Israelites experience. And verse 42 to 45, I quote here, to show that God remembered his holy promise given to his servant Abraham. And God brought out his people with rejoicing, his chosen ones with shouts of joy. Okay, this, uh, the Bible has this, uh, this style of writing where it often repeats itself. Uh, or rephrases itself. His people will be his chosen ones. Uh, brought up with rejoicing, and it's the same meaning as shouts of joy, okay? This pattern of repeating itself, rephrasing in different words, the same idea. And God gave them the lands of the nations, and that's where we are now at moving on to Joshua. They are going to take over the the lands that belong to all the pagan nations, and they fell heir. Heir means they, uh, they inherit. They fell heir to what others had toiled for. 
what the pagan nations worked very hard for, the Israelites came and they took possession as their inheritance from God. Now, here is the, here is the big, big concept here. All these things that they might keep God's precepts and observe his laws. Praise the Lord. All right, so here we see that all the things that they were blessed with by God were given to them so that they might obey and keep God's laws. So we see that God blesses us with all these things that the Bible has uh, talked about. God blesses us for us to see his goodness, to experience joy. You see the shouts of joy and rejoicing and to obey him, knowing he has a good purpose for us in his promise. Uh, so that, that is uh, the two things I want to say to round off on the, the Israelites. Okay, What they do, what they behave and what they are like is very similar to us and we can learn application lessons for ourselves. And second thing is that whatever they went through and God's blessings is to teach them to keep his commands, obey his laws. And God has many blessings for them in the journey. Now, another thing I want to talk about is this giving of the law for literal people in a tangible world. And that's a round off for Genesis all the way to Deuteronomy. We see when we read the Bible, the Old Testament tells us that God created the world and God created people in a literal and tangible world. It's a physical world. We can see, we can touch, right? And people live and relate to things that happen in a very literal way because it's a tangible environment. The world around us, okay, and the tangible ways that we can relate to through our senses. So God gives us a physical world that we relate through our eyes, seeing, hearing, tasting, touching, smelling. And then God gives the law to address them living literal lives in this literal world, this beautiful world God has made. And this world is governed by the laws of science. Okay, so we have... Uh, we are told by Moses, and in fact, the Israelites, they get to understand from these five books called the books of the law of Moses, that God created this world using the laws of science, and they have a place in this world, right? So, so we know that this world was created. It didn't come about by evolution. And so there's a whole topic of... Uh, faith versus evolution, but the Bible tells us very clearly it is about God who created this world, okay? And science is actually part of God's creation. We should understand that we should not be trying to under, uh, trying to argue whether it's science or versus religion, okay? It's not science versus faith, but Understand that we are created in a world, okay, of science that is created, science itself is created by God. So besides laws of science, God also gave people the Old Testament physical laws of Moses. And here's another set of laws that is spiritual laws or spiritual principles, and these laws, they are just like scientific law or scientific principles. They are unseen. You can't see these laws, but you can see their results. For example, scientific law, there's a law of gravity. We can't see gravity, but we know there's gravity because we can see the results of gravity. You can't see the wind, but you can see the results of wind when it works. Right, so that is an example. These are two examples of science, the laws of science. Gravity 
and wind. You can't see them, but you know they exist when you see the results, what they do. And it is the same with spiritual principles that are closely tied to human actions. You know, uh, when we obey or disobey God, we will see the results of spiritual principles happening. There will be the results or not so good one. We use the word consequences. If you don't, if you don't mind the word, some, the, sometimes the word, the Bible uses the word curses. Yeah, curses. Okay, so there will be spiritual results or consequences, whether we realize the connection of these consequences to the law. Okay, if we obey, then God says that you will be blessed. So that is a result, a good result, if you obey. Then if you disobey, there will be consequences of bad things happening. So that is the principles at work with the results. Example, uh, we may not even know about the existence of gravity if we cannot connect the fact that, oh, things fall down to the ground because the law of gravity is at work. You see, we know the law of gravity is at work because things fall down to the ground. They don't float in the air. Yeah, so that is a, that's a scientific law. So God gives the Old Testament laws right, to Moses and his people to guide his people in their living. And the law describes, we, see, we have seen the law, many examples, describes the actions, what you do, what you don't do, what you should practice, and what should be your lifestyle. To show and to teach his people what is acceptable and what is not acceptable to be a holy people. Okay, so in this way, they know what God is like. Yeah, what is holy, what is not holy, they know what God is like. And then there's another part about the wars and the killings. You know, a lot of people say, wow, this, this God in the Old Testament is very violent. Tells the people to go to war and tells people to kill others. Now, why these wars and killings are there is that God tells his people to carry out in the Old Testament these are a literal way, okay? Literal, that means it is something you can see and you can see it happening. A literal way to show that he will judge and he will punish those who live sinful and unrepentant lives. So very literally for literal people in a literal world, God is saying, you do this kind of actions, you will be killed. You do these kinds of, you live these kinds of wrong, sinful lives, you will die. God is showing people that in the same way, he will one day judge those who live in the same unacceptable ways as the people in the Bible who were punished for being sinful and unrepentant. Okay? So the wars and the killings that God commanded in the Old Testament is his way of telling people who are literal that you will literally be judged and punished for your sin and unrepentance one day. Okay, because we are literal people, we understand literal actions. That's what the Old Testament wars and killings are about. God's warning. God's way of teaching people, telling people, you will be judged for your sin and unrepentance. Now, so the spiritual laws that people cannot see and sometimes don't know or understand, these laws come into effect through the laws of God as a result. If they live correctly, then the, there will be good results happening. If they live badly, then there will be consequences. Example, the law of sin is death, right? This is a spiritual law, Romans 6, 23. So I put this in a flowchart form to hopefully make it a little easier to understand and relate to in case you don't understand all those words up there. So here's the literal, okay? Literal means we can see, we can touch. The physical world that God created 
is governed by laws of science. Okay, physical world is governed by laws of science. All the that's why we study law, uh, study science subjects because then we can um, we can use science to make things happen and to do things. Yeah. So example, the law of gravity is a law of science, and you see that it this law of gravity, okay, will give us this result of things will fall down or things will be pulled downward. So if you jump into the air, you definitely will be pulled downward to land on the floor. Yeah, and that happens because of the law of gravity. Okay, so that's a law and that's a result of the law. Now, so that's the literal or physical world. Then we are given the law of Moses. Okay, God gives the law of Moses in the written form. So that's the, the equivalent of the physical world. Now, the law of Moses is governed by spiritual law. So whatever people are told to do, do not commit adultery, do not murder, okay? Uh, do not uh, have sexual immorality or the good part will be the blessings, okay? So there will be, a, there will be spiritual law. If you commit murder, then spiritual law, there will be something that will be the result. So for example, the law of sin, which is a spiritual law, law of sin is the result, death. Okay, if you commit sin, death will result. Spiritual law, if it's a law of obedience, it will result in life, long life, good, bless, blessed life. Spiritual law, when Jesus died, okay, the result is atonement or redemption. Another law, when you receive Jesus as your saviour, the result, you are born again as a child of, of God, or another word is regeneration. You have new life in Christ. Okay, so God gives us a physical world that is governed by the laws of science, and these are what happens. When God gives the law of Moses, there is the spiritual law inside there that will have all these laws with all these consequences. So these are just some examples. Okay, so at the same time, God gives man grace and mercy many times in the Old Testament. Uh, we may not come across the word called grace and mercy in the Old Testament, but you see that constantly God does actually give people uh, grace and mercy by not killing them, for example. And in the New Testament, God continues to show grace and mercy. God is the same God. Old Testament, New Testament, God still shows grace and mercy. And this time, it's easy because it's actually specified the work of Jesus. Example, Ephesians 2, 8 to 9. Okay, it's by grace you have been saved through the work of Christ. So in grace and mercy, God gives people time to be saved and time to live a life of genuine faith and character formation for eternity. Because God has planned a destiny for people, for us, from before creation. And God does not want anyone to miss out on the opportunity of this eternal destiny. And we can find that in 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Uh, sorry, chapter 3, verse 9. Okay, right. So we finish this thing about giving God giving the law and it's very literal law for literal people in a literal world. And this applies, okay, uh, the law is given to us all the way from Genesis to Deut Deuteronomy. All the spiritual law as well as the laws of Moses. Okay, the last thing I want to do to round off is uh, somebody asked a question or uh, somebody talked about the making vows. Deuteronomy chapter 23, verses 21 to 23 was talking about making a vow. So the question was asked, what about Christian 
swearing in court because God tells us not to not to break your vow. Okay? Not to make a vow or when you make a vow, you should you should fulfill it. And here's Matthew 5, 33 to 37. Jesus talking, telling people, don't break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. Don't swear. And for Jesus, he says, don't even swear an oath at all. All you need to say is simply yes or no. So that is Jesus, okay? Don't even make a vow. Don't even swear. Just say yes or no. And you know, James chapter 5 verse 12 also says the same thing. Don't vow, don't swear. Simply say yes or no. Uh, what Jesus means and what James is saying is that, that Christians should not need to swear. That's what they are basically saying. Christians should not need to swear. Christians should be so honest that their word is trustworthy all by itself. People take oaths or people swear to impress, impress you with sincerity and intensity, to say very strong words, I swear. Okay. Now, Christians should not need to take an oath of any kind because they should be people who can be believed without the need to impress or convince people with the intensity of an oath. In other words, Christians should say what they mean and then they mean what they say. They should not be people who say one thing but mean or intend something else. So let what you say be a simple and honest yes or no. That's what Jesus and James 5 are actually saying. Okay, Whatever you want to say, let it be simple and honest, yes or no. Don't need to swear. Don't need to take an oath. Now, looking back at what Jesus says, don't swear at all. This is in the context of a person who is saying something trying to convince the person they are talking to that they are telling the truth. If you look specifically at verse 33, it shows that the oath is made to God. Yeah, the oath is made to God. You see that? Do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. That is the, that is the Old Testament Deuteronomy law. Fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. Okay, so person trying to convince the person they're talking to and in this case they are actually talking to God and there is no need to make an oath that means to swear or take a vow with God because God knows what we are like and all we need is to mean and fulfill what we say we will do so that is the basic thing about us as individuals uh, talking about not taking an oath, not swearing. But then when we talk about in court, how about a Christian witness taking the oath in court where we are asked to swear to tell the truth while holding the Bible, right? Now, this situation is different from we are telling the truth in a court, okay? The situation that we were talking about just now is different from when we are telling the truth in a court. There, we assume that the Christian is to be consistent. If you tell the truth when you're speaking to a person or speaking to God, all the more as a Christian, you and I should tell the truth when giving testimony in court. Correct? We should still remain the same kind of person. We tell the truth outside court, we go to the court, we tell the same truth. But then here, the court is a different situation and environment. See, the court deals with a whole range of all kinds of people in the country. And the court expects every person, doesn't matter your race, your language, your religion, whether you are supposedly a trustworthy or not trustworthy person, the court expects everyone to tell the truth. It is our social culture. 
right, that has this practice to put everyone on the same level to give honest testimony in court. Now, you can imagine what the situation would be like if Christians go to court and they say, oh, I'm a Christian, you should believe me. So they don't take an oath and they don't swear on the Bible. Then if a Christian can do that, then individuals and people of other religions can also say, oh, you should believe me because my religion makes me an honest person. And then they don't take the oath to tell the truth. Yeah, you see, if Christians start the ball rolling by saying, oh, because I'm a Christian, I tell the truth, I should not have to take an oath, that everybody will want to say, claim the same thing. Yeah, everybody will say, my religion makes me an honest person, so I don't need to take an oath. Actually, nowadays, there's a lot more flexibility to comply with the states. There are people of different faiths. You know, they choose to take their oath to tell the truth based on their own religious scripture, whatever their faith may be. So they may not swear on a Bible, they may swear on their own uh, religious scripture. And this way also puts everyone on the same level to tell the truth in court. And so therefore, for the Christian, the Christian takes their oath on the Bible as a testimony that they will be truthful before God in a court of law. Now, however, there are some Christians who are very insistent. Some Christians take Matthew 5, 33 to 37 as proof okay, that we cannot swear at all, at all, not even in a court. So some Christians are that strong. Okay, Now, if it bothers the conscience of a believer to swear in court because of this Matthew 5, then they should not do so based on Romans 14.23. Okay, can someone help us turn to uh, Romans 14.23? Romans 14, uh, verse 23. But the man who has doubts is condemned if he eats because his eating is not from faith. And everything that does not come from faith is sin. Thank you, Mac. Okay, so down here is actually a principle. Okay, it's a principle that if you... Uh, the, the chapter is actually about food offered to idols. Yeah. So the principle here is that if, if there's a certain kind of food that you feel uh, does not support your faith, if you eat it, then you should not eat it. That, that's the basic idea. Okay, if it comes from faith that it's wrong to eat that fruit, food, then you should not eat that food. So here, the if, if it's wrong that you should not swear in court, then you should not swear at all. That, that is the principle that some Christians will very strongly stand on. Okay, we believe or they believe that cannot swear in court because of what Jesus says, and so they will not do so. But then, uh, taking this matter as a matter of doctrine is not justified actually by the faith, by the context of Matthew 5 and James 5 verse 12, which is about personal interactions, not talking about a court situation. Okay? Uh, for the majority of us, it is not a sin, not a violation of God's law to take a vow to tell the truth in court because we are following the law of the land and this law does not exactly violate God's law. Okay, so I have finished uh, rounding off for um, Genesis to Deuteronomy.